We have two scripture readings uh, this morning. And the first one is, if you're uh, wanting to follow along in the Sanctuary Bibles there in the uh, rack uh, where you're seated, seated, our first uh, is Matthew chapter 11, and that's on page 1513. 1513, if you care to follow along uh, with the Sanctuary Bible. Again, from Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned. You've revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble, in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So as I'm turning to Psalm 23, which is on page 862, 862 in the Sanctuary Bible, uh, just a, a comment that our sermon today is called The Gentleness of Jesus, and Psalm number 23 is referred to as the uh, Psalm of the Gentle Shepherd. And as we hear those uh, verses read, you'll, you'll recall once again why. This is a reading from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beloved of God, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. For centuries, biblical scholars, theologians, preachers have pointed to the scriptures in the Old and the New Testament and taught and believed that Jesus Christ has fulfilled, is fulfilling, and will fulfill every scripture in the Bible, every one. Psalm 23 is a wonderful example of how Jesus Christ fulfilled God's word. Now, King David, uh, he wasn't only a king, he was a warrior, he was uh, the leader of Israel, uh, he was a poet, he was a songwriter, he was a musician, and he had his uh, shortcomings and sin, and uh, he didn't meet Jesus face to face during his lifetime in about 1,000 before Christ was born. But Jesus was one of his descendants through Mary. Mary Mary's genealogy is traced through uh, uh, the line of David. And so David's great descendant, Jesus, end up, ended up fulfilling the words that David wrote in the song, which they sang like a hymn, like we sing in church hymns, 
uh, Psalm 23. And to make that point a little more vivid, uh, I wanted to reread Psalm 23, inserting the name of Jesus, where it says the Lord or he or his or things like that. Lord Jesus, you are my shepherd, therefore I lack nothing. Lord Jesus, you make me to lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside the quiet waters. You refresh my soul. Jesus, you guide me along the right paths of your word for the glory of your name. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because, Jesus, you are with me. You comfort and protect me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell with you, Lord Jesus, forever and ever. Gives us a little more insight as to how uh, one psalm, and of course they all do, uh, was fulfilled and is being fulfilled and will be fulfilled in uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God promised David that one of his descendants would reign over all the nations and set up an eternal kingdom. And of course, after Jesus died and was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, that's what Jesus has been doing every day, you know, 24-7, 365, uh, for the last couple thousand years. But what I want to talk about today is the way that Jesus rules in his kingdom over uh, the church and over the world gently with gentleness, which is one of the fruit of the Spirit, until he comes again where he won't be so gentle dealing with the wicked and those who commit evil and will punish um, evildoers, but of course will reward uh, the righteous and um, uh, bring us, all who believe, into the eternal kingdom. Um, I, I just want to interrupt for a moment. Today's going to be a really hot day, and I know we've been closing the door for security purposes, but I think uh, for the interest of keeping the sanctuary as cool as we can, if we could just maybe open that door a little bit, that way we'll get um, air movement coming through. So thank you very much, uh, Bob. I'm reminded that God, Father, Son, and Spirit are gentle. Many don't believe that about God. If they do believe in God, or if they do believe in the Jewish or Christian God, they often think of God as being angry and judgmental and the God who condemns and, and you know, is wrathful and mean. But when you look at Scripture and when you think about what God has done, throughout human, the history of human civilization, and even before that, it's not hard to see that God is gentle. God is loving. God is kind. God is patient. Starting with Jesus, one of the three in the Trinity, Jesus was gentle. When Jesus touched people, he healed them. He didn't grab them by their robes and say, be healed. When Jesus prayed for people, he, his prayers were gentle. When Jesus felt moved with compassion for those who were lost and did not know God, his response was gentle to uh, pray, to invite people to trust in him. And uh, Jesus was gentle with uh, lepers, he was gentle with prostitutes, he was gentle with tax collectors, and his desire was that 
everyone would hear the good news that in Jesus Christ they are forgiven and come to know the Lord and be forgiven and become children of God. Jesus was and is a gentle Messiah, Savior. Jesus hears your prayers. And as our gentle shepherd, we know that when we pray to Jesus, he hears. And when we pray according to the will of God that is in alignment with the, the word of God, we know our prayers are heard and answered in God's time and God's way. Moving from Jesus to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a gentle God, capital G. The Spirit indwells us. The Spirit abides and empowers us. The Spirit enlivens our souls so that we find uh, our thoughts uh, coming back to God and centering on God. This is what the Spirit does. But He does it invisibly. He does it quietly, that still, quiet voice. And He does it in a way that glorifies not Himself, but the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father in heaven is a gentle God. When David wrote his song that we call Psalm 23, he said things like, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. He feeds me in green pastures. He renews, he restores my soul. And he was talking about his relationship with God and the way God gently nourished David's faith and his spiritual life and led David and blessed David and protected David and comforted David. Uh, your, he said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So every shepherd who was worth their salary had a rod, which was like a police baton, to deal with wolves or to bop a sheep or a lamb on the head if they were wandering off and heading down into a ravine or getting in the brambles or whatever. They also had a staff, and you know what a staff is, it's that big giant hook and they would reach out and they'd grab a sheep and pull it in. David used those shepherd tools as metaphors pointing to how God pulls us back to himself, saves us from sin, from temptation, from harm, and yet does so gently. He doesn't just jerk us, you know, like we're on a choke chain with a, you know, walking a dog. God, our Father in heaven, is a gentle God. He's your shepherd. He nourishes you from the inside out, imparting the peace of Jesus Christ, the love of Christ, the goodness of Christ, the gentleness of Jesus into your very soul through the Holy Spirit. Well, I thought I'd uh, do something a little different this morning. Um, and I hope this is encouraging to you. When we think of uh, God as creator, we don't think of a, a gentle God because if God spoke and the universe came into being, you know, you're talking about galaxies and stars and huge celestial you know, creations that must have been incredibly spectacular whenever and however long that took to happen. I don't, I'm not a scientist, I don't know. Um, but when we think of God and his uh, work as creator, the idea of God being a gentle God is, does, isn't the first thing that, that comes to mind is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but think about this. When you look at a rose, a red rose, a yellow rose, a white rose, a pink rose. That helps me think of a gentle God who wanted roses to be various colors. If you've ever walked along the seashore of a lake or uh, a beach, an ocean uh, beach, and, and you see the waves just gently, you know, lapping, being pulled back by the tide and then uh, breaking again, quietly, softly. That makes me think of a God who wanted to give his people, his creation, uh, a calming uh, part of nature. 
And when, when you're there on the beach like that or on a lake and you look out over the waters and, and you hear that sound and you watch it, you're calmed because God is a gentle uh, creator. Even on those who reject God, who hate Christians, who hate um, what is good, God sends the rain. God gently provides and sustains even those who have nothing to do with God. Now, pushing the uh, illustration of nature a little bit further, I want to remind us that we humans are one of nine million species. Okay, you are one species, our human uh, civil, civilization, one of nine million species. We live on a planet called Earth in a sliver, a tiny sliver of that planet's uh, uh, atmosphere. It's called the biosphere. All of life, animals, humans, fish, birds, whatever, live in the biosphere where there's air, there's oxygen, there's water, there's land. Now, the biosphere is 12 miles or so thick, and it's, it surrounds and covers the entire planet. And the biosphere, even though it's 12 miles thick, is one one thousandth of the size of the Earth. So this world that we live in, whether it's in Delta or Denver or Montana or Virginia or wherever we travel to or another country, we're living in a realm that's one one thousandth of the entire planet, okay? So keep that in mind. And yet, like right now in our worship service, uh, we, don't, we don't feel the other 99% or so of the earth moving and shaking and, and screaming through its orbit at 1,000 miles an hour and rotating on its axis at 600 miles an hour, do we? I mean, we can barely feel the breeze coming that we're creating with the evaporative cooler. It takes a gentle creator to create a universe and a planet and an existence like you and I have. Think about this. Everything from Mount Everest, the top of Mount Everest, to the deepest ocean trench, and even above Everest and below Everest, is the biosphere and the crust of the Earth. Now, below the crust of the Earth, is what's called the mantle. 1,800 miles of a semi-liquid that makes up 84% of Earth. And this is where the lava and the magma and all that stuff come from, from the uh, mantle. Below the mantle is the core, the inner and the outer core. Uh, and by the way, uh, temperatures in the mantle that's 84% of the Earth can reach as high as roughly 6,000 degrees. So today is going to be a hot day in Delta. We might hit 103 or whatever. Not nearly 6,000, right? I'm not sure that will comfort you when you're sweltering out there today, but just wanted to point that out. But wait, there's more it gets hotter as you go to the core of the Earth. At the core of the Earth, the inner and outer, outer core, 1,400 miles in diameter, molten iron surrounding solid iron with temperatures as high as 11,000 degrees. 
Now the closest I can come to anything near that is walking in the kitchen when Rhonda has the oven up to like 450 and I'm going, oh, it's warm in here. Um, 11,000 degrees and you and I are walking and sitting over that right now. So down, you know, thousands of miles is 11,000 degrees. Our God is a gentle God who enables us and who has blessed us with a calm, peaceful sliver we call the biosphere on the crust of the earth to live and move and have being, to love God, to love others as self. When God said, let there be the light, let there be the sky, let there be the sun, the moon, the stars, let there be the animals, the plants, the birds, the fish, and then finally, let there be women and men, humans. And when God said everything was good, Eden, that first place where God's creation lived in complete harmony with God, could be described as a gentle, wonderful world. My, how far we have come from Eden. Uh, God gives us life on this planet, but God also gives us the assurance of eternal life in the life to come through faith in Christ. When I disobey God, and I'm working on doing that less and less and less, as I know you are as well, God deals with me gently, with compassion, with faithfulness. God remembers his covenant that he made through the death of Jesus Christ, his son, the Lamb of God. You know, in, back in the days, thousands of years ago, animals were sacrificed in order to uh, enact a covenant. When God made a covenant with Abraham, that, that's what happened. There, there were sacrifices. Well, Jesus, the Lamb of God, was sacrificed. And as a result, God provided for you and for me a way back to God even after we break God's law and sin. And it's called forgiveness. Our prayer of confession every Sunday uh, reminds us of that. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. But like you, I'm sure I'm finding more and more, it's becoming more and more challenging to be gentle with our world today. Our world uh, continues to be broken, fallen. Uh, there's, there's so much corruption and evil doing and greed and hate and violence and oppression and injustice and I could go on and on. It's not so easy to be gentle like God is gentle and provides and gives life even to the wicked, even to those who reject God. Philip Keller, uh, who wrote the book A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, also wrote, as I mentioned in this series uh, of sermons, a gardener looks at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He said that it is the gentleness of Jesus that deepens our faith in God and empowers us to love God and love others. The generous kindness of Jesus is our model, our example. And his gentleness humbles our haughty hearts, crumbling the tough crust that accumulates around our self-centered characters. This inflowing impartation of the gentle and gracious Holy Spirit displaces our self-preoccupation and grants us the same fruit of the character of Jesus Christ and specifically the gentleness of Jesus. So right here, right now, in the Presbyterian Church of Delta, the Holy Spirit is at work in your life and mine, creating, imparting, the very life and the very characteristics of Jesus Christ. 
thanks be to God that even though in our own resources we can't uh, be like Jesus all the time, uh, uh, loving, uh, peaceful, uh, gentle, good, kind, but thanks be to God that because God lives within us and empowers us from the inside out, we can please God. We can be loving. We can be kind. We can be peaceful and good and generous and gentle. I invite you to pray with me.